good evening um, and then, hello, uh, uh, my name is Abby Jung. I'm the Director of Education Services um, at the Durham Museum. And on behalf of the Durham, I would like to welcome you uh, to tonight's event, which is called From Frying Pans to Fenders. Um, my name, uh, like I said, is Abby, and I have the absolute pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker uh, to you. Before I do, though, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsors um, of the exhibit that inspired uh, tonight's event, which is called Guitar, the Instrument that Rocked the World. Uh, and those include the Richard Brooke Foundation, Mutual of Omaha, the Lori and David Scott Foundation, Douglas County, Susan and George Haddix, and media support is provided by KETV. Um, a brief te technical note before we begin, uh, we do ask that you stay muted. Um, I know sometimes people prefer to have their video on or off, um, but either way, my best advice for you is to have your Zoom set in presenter mode. Then you will always see the most important thing on the screen, whether that be our special guest um, or some images uh, that we'll be screen sharing with you or images here in the exhibit. Um, you can adjust that by using the icon um, in uh, the corner of your your Zoom screen. And again, you're looking for it to say presenter mode. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Uh, so many of you uh, joined us when this incredible exhibit first opened uh, for a virtual presentation uh, with Mr. Kenneth Bay, where we looked at the first 500 years of the history of the guitar. Uh, everybody seemed to really enjoy that presentation, but we could not let the exhibit close, which happens in a couple of weeks, without uh, talking a little bit more about the history of after those 500 years and specifically the electric guitar. Uh, there's no better person to help us with that than our speaker for tonight, H.P. Uh, Newquist, who is executive director at the National Guitar Museum. Mr. Newquist is an award-winning author. Documentary, documentary director, broadcast producer, and the former editor-in-chief of Guitar Magazine. Newquist not only oversees the development of the National Guitar Museum, but also serves at it as its chief curator. His unique background and experience led to the creation of this amazing exhibit, uh, which you will see more of this evening. During the course of his career, Mr. Newquist has worked with hundreds of guitarists, written more than 20 books that have been translated into dozens of languages, and worked on making advanced technology an everyday reality. Most recently, his first novel, Behemoth, uh, became available, which, uh, full confession, I started reading earlier today, and I am doing a personal plug for uh, you all to check it out. Uh, now, please uh, join me in giving a virtual welcome to our guest speaker for tonight, Mr. H.P. Newquist. Thank you. Um, that was very nice of you, Abby. Um, I think one of the reasons she's plugging my book, Behemoth, is that we both realize that one of the central characters' name is Abby. So uh, she has an immediate affinity for it, but uh, thank you for the plug. Uh, we're here to talk about not 500 years of the guitar, but we're here to talk about 70 to 80 years of the guitar. And we're going to discuss the role of electricity in the guitar. We're not gonna talk about much of the history um, I'll give you a little bit of, of that, but I want to bring you up to speed pretty quickly. We'll talk for 40, 45 minutes, and then I'll throw it open to anything anybody wants to know about guitars, books, museums, anything you want to talk about we'll be open to. Uh, so I want to start uh, by uh, opening a, a presentation here, which I'm going to have under the control of Abby. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, there never used to be such a thing as an acoustic guitar, or acoustic instruments and electric instruments until the 1930s. Whoops, that's moving. Until the 1930s, whoops. Abby, that's moving somehow um, without me touching it. There we go. Well, we'll start here. Um, and I'm not sure it's letting me control the screen still. All the joys of Zoom and, and Google Windows and all that stuff. Um, but essentially the history of the guitar starts um, roughly 5,000 years ago. And 5,000 years ago is when we had the very first stringed instruments that we know of. 
Um, and the reason we tried 5,000 years ago is 5,000 years ago was 3,000 BC. And 3,000 BC is where we have the demarcation line of history versus prehistory. Uh, I'm gonna try clicking this again. Um, so anything prior to 5,000 years ago, 3,000 BC is considered prehistoric. Uh, anything post 3,000 BC is what we consider history because we have written information or pictorial information about it. So we know that the instruments, first stringed instruments go back at least to 3000 uh, BC. And those were typically stringed instruments from uh, uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa and parts of Europe um, that were built on gourds with uh, either vines or uh, sheep skin or sheep gut, cat gut strings. And that was pretty much history of, of these of stringed instruments up until right around the beginning of the 20th century. And the reason things changed is the purpose of this presentation. So let's talk about what kind of instruments we have. We have acoustic instruments. Now an acoustic instrument is any instrument that produces sound without using electricity. So essentially, don't uh, jumping over there for me. Hold on. I'm going to try and make sure this moves a little bit better. Nope, getting lots of noises, but not things moving. Um, I'm going to, uh, I might have to ask you to forward that then, Abby. Um, and now go back one, perhaps. Uh, jump, there we go. Okay. So acoustic, sorry about the glitch. Um, acoustic instruments basically create vibrations in the air. And those vibrations are translated into sound waves by our ears. And that's true whether you're playing the flute or banging on a drum or playing the guitar. Sound waves are emanating from that instrument to your ears. Well, for the vast majority of the history of stringed instruments, those, uh, those particular acoustic instruments were not very loud um, because you've got these thin strings that were made of catgut, which again is sheep, sheep intestines, and you had it on a kind of a small body of a guitar or an oud or a lute or anything that preceded it. So it wasn't very loud compared to things like drums or piano or a cathedral organ or a trumpet or a saxophone. So guitar players have really spent the last hundred and almost 50 years trying to make the guitar louder. Now, this is the kind of thing that a guitar had to compete against. This is Glenn Miller's band. And in it, you see drums, grand piano, trombone, saxophones, trumpets, and one little guy way in the middle in the back there playing a guitar who is not going to be heard at all. But there always had to be a guitar as part of the band. There was always a part written for the guitar. So when you look at where that guitar came from, and we've gone back 5,000 years as I talked about, you really have a set of, of instruments that, that weren't loud and weren't designed to be loud until the early days of the 20th century, the early 1900s. That really changed when, and I don't know, can you switch back to me, Abby, at all? Um, and you don't have to, maybe people can see me with this, but um, the front, here's a little science lesson. A guitar, all the sounds from a guitar comes from here, this front face. Doesn't come from the hole, doesn't come from the sides or the back. It all comes from the face and the face vibrates in sympathy with the strings and forces air to be pushed forward. And that's what makes a guitar loud. So I can have a, a nice kind of thin sound if I don't play very hard. But if I do play hard, it's gonna make this vibrate more. That's gonna vibrate a lot louder. This is going to be pushing much more air forward. Now, that's all well and good temporarily. We can go back to the presentation. Um, but it's still not loud enough when you have six, seven, eight other pieces in the, uh, in the band. So the guitar I just showed you is called a Martin D28. It's, and there's a picture of it here. 
it's really the biggest guitar ever made. Um, there are others that have been biggest, but it's the standard big guitar. And it was made this big so that it would produce a lot of sound going outwards. And um, it was called the Dreadnought, and I'm trying to move it forward. Can you advance that one for me? Um, let's see. Okay, right. We have, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the Martin Dreadnought on the screen or the one that she's got on her, uh, on her camera, but the Martin Dreadnought was introduced in 1931. And here we have Hank Williams playing it. And the reason for having that big a guitar is the more surface area you have, the more air is being pushed out. And it was good enough to compete at least for a while with a stand-up bass and a small drum kit, maybe a stand-up piano, loud enough to hold its own, at least for a while. Um, and now we're gonna go back to the, uh, the presentation. And um, the Dreadnought was called the Dreadnought, by the way, because not only was it a big, um, not only was it a big guitar, but it was designed to be impressive. And it was named after the British Dreadnought, which at the time was the biggest, most feared battleship in the world. So the Martin Dreadnought was, you can't get a bigger, bigger guitar than this. And if you look at it here, um, it's standing next to what we have also have in the exhibit, which is one of the very first six strings ever made. It was made in 1806 in Italy. And you can see the difference from 1806 to 1931, how much bigger the guitar got because it needed to be louder and louder when it was competing with other instruments. Uh, the Dreadnought, however, still had its limitations. Um, it's, the limitation was that the bigger bands got and the bigger auditoriums got, the harder it was to keep hearing the guitar. So we're gonna jump back about 15 years to see how that all changed to become the origin of the electric guitar. And that really starts in 1915 in San Francisco. And in 1915 in San Francisco, the Panama Pacific Exposition was held. And essentially that was a World's Fair, much like we think of World's Fairs today with pavilions from countries all around the world showing their culture and their food and and dance and music and, and every building was dedicated to a particular culture or country. Well, in the Panama Pacific Convention or, or Exposition, it was being held to, uh, to commemorate the opening of the Panama Canal. So they were inviting primarily Pacific region countries and, re and areas to come exhibit. Well, the most popular exhibit in that exposition was the Hawaiian Pavilion. Now in 1915, Hawaii was still not uh, a state. It was still kind of an exotic island stuck out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But Americans were beyond thrilled with the idea of Hawaiian music and hula skirts and hula hoops and just thoroughly smitten uh, in the days before World War I with the Hawaiian culture. So believe it or not, from about 1915 to the beginning of World War II, Hawaiian music was the most popular form of music in the United States. It was more popular than jazz and country and Western, than folk. Um, people bought more uh, sheet music, went to more concerts. In the early days of recordings, they bought more recordings of Hawaiian music than anything else. And that's why to this day, we have things like Mele Kalikimaka at Christmas. And we had, um, a huge infatuation with Hawaiian culture all around the United States. You think of tiki bars and Mai Tais and Trader Vic restaurants with thatched roofs. All of that came from the, the huge, uh, that went a little too fast. Um, all of that had to do with the huge impact that the, um, that the uh, Hawaiian pavilion and the culture had in America. So American, gobbled up Hawaiian music almost to the exclusion of everything else for almost three decades. I'm going to move this forward if I can. There we go. Well, there was a guy named George Beecham who was actually uh, from Texas but lived in California. And he started a band to capitalize on this Hawaiian music. 
uh, he was a guitar player and he started a band so that he could tour around much like rock bands do today, but they were gonna play Hawaiian music. And something I want you to see in this picture is that George is holding his guitar flat on his lap. It's, it's what we call face up playing. Hawaiian music was made to be played with the face up and not out as we commonly think of it today. And that's because the Hawaiian guitar, which is called lap steel, is played with a piece of steel in the left hand that glides up and down the neck. Instead of using your fingers to fret it, you kind of get that uh, tiny bubble sound, that na -na 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 sound that goes with it. So it's played lap, um, it's played face up or lap steel. And you'll be seeing this in the next few slides. So don't think of the guitar as we normally do, which is face out. Think of it as face up for the next few slides. Um, one of the things that, uh, whoops, one of the things that, these are zipping fast. One of the things that uh, happened quite early on with, with George Beecham is that as his band and other Hawaiian bands started playing larger venues. So they went from playing small, intimate, little kind of, I almost want to say church halls to, um, to theaters and to, uh, to regular performance halls. His band was louder than he was. He was a guitar player, he can hear himself. So he came up with the idea of making a guitar out of metal and building what was essentially a speaker cone into the middle of it. And as you see here, this is called a resonator guitar because it resonates this circle in the middle, um, which is kind of like an inverted speaker cone. It's designed to push more sound outside of the guitar. Well, he worked with a couple of, of Czech immigrants named the Dapira brothers who went by the name Dobros. And today we call this style of guitar a Dobro. Uh, and Beecham for a long time was quite happy with it. It was louder, it's kind of tinny. Uh, again, still played in his lap. Um, you can see it here being played by an indigenous Hawaiian woman. And it worked well for a period of time. It was loud enough that he could kind of compete with the horns and the keyboards and some of the drums and the singers and the hula dancers. But as it got even bigger and bigger and they started playing these huge rooms in places like New York City, you know, where you have dancers out front with drums and percussion instruments and you've got horns, the guy with the guitar is still sitting back there wishing he could hear himself. And especially Beecham, because it was his band and he couldn't even hear himself, but he could hear everybody else in the band, which for those of you who are musicians, you can understand that ego plays a a bit of a role in not being able to hear yourself when your name is is leading the band. So he was continually trying to discover how could he get even louder in front of an audience. Um, here he is doing his best with a guitar that he know wasn't going to get any louder, even though he put a, a metal cone into it. So what he did was introduce the concept of electricity to the guitar. And here's where we're gonna get a little bit um, technical and scientific for you. He took a lap steel and basically built it in the shape of a frying pan. And as you can see on the, uh, on the diagram on the left, which is actually a patent application, it looks very much like a frying pan. But he designed it this way because he, realized that metal strings on, an, on a, a, steel, a lap steel guitar vibrated. And if he used magnets, which were just then being used for speakers, for radios, they would vibrate, the speakers or the magnet would vibrate, the electromagnetic field, which surrounds all magnets, would vibrate if you uh, ran a metal string by it and you vibrated that string, it would interrupt the magnetic field. And you can see this if you take a piece of metal or two magnets even better and put one next to the other. And you can see one magnet will push another magnet away. And that's because they're interrupting each other's magnetic fields. Well, using guitar strings only interrupted that magnetic field very little bit, but just enough that the magnets would pick up the signal and he could attach that to copper wire and the, the vibrations and that electromagnetic single signal would go through that copper wire 
and he could attach it to a speaker. And at that time, there were no such thing as amplifiers, but they did have radio speakers. And he could amplify this guitar by playing steel strings underneath magnets. So those magnets were called pickups, which basically define what they do. They pick up the string vibrations. So he introduced this in 1932. And I think now if we go over to, uh, to the actual exhibit with Abby, um, what we have here is um, the, the production actually started in 1934. He introduced it in 32, 1934. This is number 11 off the, um, the production line in 1934. And I use the term production line because it's really important. This was the first mass produced electric guitar. Before this, there were no electric guitars that were produced in any way, shape or form other than people trying to make their own or, or something that they were fiddling around with as hobbyists. The frying pan was the very first uh, mass produced electric guitar. And again, it was designed to be played face up, but it became instantly successful. And uh, it wasn't, as I've been saying, designed for amplifying the blues or jazz or rock and roll, which most people believe is the origin of the electric guitar. It was designed so that Hawaiian lap steel players could hear themselves. And we have Hawaiian music to thank for the original production, mass production of the electric guitar. So that was 1934. Now I'm gonna jump back here, Abby. And, okay, and click here. One more click perhaps, not quite, all right, there we go. So there's the, the instrument that you just saw hanging up and there's the patent application next to it. Oh, whoop, that kind of has a bit of a delay here. So I'm gonna jump back a little bit uh, go back, go back, go back. There we go. The first time the guitar was ever played in public, <laughs> the first time the guitar was ever played in public was in Wichita, Kansas, Halloween night in 1932. A guy named Gage Brewer uh, was given a prototype by George Beecham to play. And so we know that in on October 30, what's, how many days in October? Halloween night, 1932. The electric guitar was introduced to a crowd in a ballroom in Wichita, not in front of a, tens of thousands of screaming rock fans, but in front of people who had come to see Hawaiian music. So from 1932, we jump a little bit forward, not far, only a couple of years or four years, to the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. An electric guitar was not useful in public if there was no electricity. And electricity was still pretty sparse in America until the Rural Electrification Act of 1936, which was designed to get the entire country on board with electricity. And that opened up the possibility for taking electric guitars into places that typically hadn't been. So bars, restaurants, uh, rural churches, a lot of homes, places that now could actually plug in a guitar if they were Hawaiian guitars and play them. So electricity plays a pretty big role in the popularity of the guitar. Now, at the professional level, at the professional level, you had great guitarists like Charlie Christian, who was playing in bands like Glenn Miller's or, Jer or uh, Jimmy Dorsey's um, big bands, but couldn't really hear themselves. So what he did was work with companies like Gibson Guitar and they would cut open a regular acoustic guitar. If you look at this guitar and picture it without the pickup, which is that black and white, almost zebra striped piece about two thirds of the way up the body. They actually cut holes in those acoustic guitars to put magnets, pickups, in them to allow the guitar to be amplified. So the introduction at the professional level for those of us who play 
face out, like a jazz player like Charlie Christian would do, was actually done by modifying acoustic guitars and adding those magnetic pickups in them to pick up the signal. Now, um, for the longest time, you had modified acoustics, like I just showed you with Charlie Christian, and you had Hawaiian players who were playing face-up last year. At this point, we hit into now the late 30s, really the early 40s, and we meet a person who's usually credited with inventing the electric guitar, who's a man named um, Les Paul. Well, we're not really ready for Les Paul. Even though Les Paul's name is associated with the electric guitar, this really isn't quite his story so much. It becomes more a story of a guy named Paul Bigsby. Now, Paul Bigsby was a motorcycle mechanic, and he liked to tinker with things. He liked to, to play around with electronics. He liked to do mechanical work. And he was a friend of Merle Travis, who was a very influential country player. Um, so influential that there's actually a style of guitar playing uh, that's known as Travis picking. Uh, he's just a phenomenal guitar player. But Merle wanted, he, wanted Paul, who was a tinkerer, to try and make him something that was like the Beecham laptop, but something he could play on stage that he could actually um, play face out. And so Bigsby came up with this shaped guitar, basically using a, a plank of wood, one pickup, which is that little silver piece in the middle, and created essentially one for Merle Travis, one for Merle to be able to use. And Merle was a very wealthy performer and everyone considered this kind of a, a, a one-off that, you know, this is great. Merle can play with the guitar facing out. Nobody else can. He's got this one off, very interesting kind of guitar. But he couldn't convince Bigsby to go into the guitar business. Bigsby did it as a favor, as this kind of inveterate tinkerer. And he went back to building motorcycles. So the continuation of the electric guitar after this single Bigsby instrument, of which he built a few for Merle Travis, but only a handful. So that was left to, everybody thinks, Les Paul. But it wasn't Les Paul, not yet anyway. What it was left to, or who it was left to, was a man named Leo Fender. Now, Leo Fender was a, a radio repairman living in Southern California outside of Bakersfield. And he was uh, a very popular repairman, um, primarily because radios and TVs were becoming very popular in Southern California, and people had money to buy those things. And he was doing, making quite a good living out of uh, being a, a radio technician. But something started happening in his shop. People started bringing in those laptops that I showed you earlier, like the frying pan. Uh, lap steel players in the uh, late 30s and early 40s came to him and said, you know, you're an electric guy. Can you, or an electrician guy, can you fix this? You know, maybe a wire broke or maybe the magnets, um, the magnet went off. Um, you know, we can't fix it. We're musicians. We don't know anything about electricity. You know, the idea of people working on their own equipment with soldering irons and, and wire toolkits just wasn't even around yet. We were only a decade into the Rural Electrification Act. So, so Leo started fixing these laptops, these lap steel rather, laptop. I'm talking about a laptop, I'm talking about a lap steel. Uh, these, these lap steels, which were again played face up. And he was very good at repairing them. But he began to hear a refrain from other people around him that had to do with the music that was becoming popular in Southern California, notably the Bakersfield sound, which was country Western on the West Coast, uh, a little bit of R&B that was being recorded out there, and the very, very beginnings of, of, of surf style music. This is happening in the late 40s. And all of those bands had guitar players who played face out. And they were like, you know, Leo, the, the Hawaiian guys all have guitars that can be amplified and they play face up and you can hear them. We can't hear ourselves. We've got a drummer who's too loud. We've got a keyboard player who can't turn down. We've got a, a trumpeter who's louder than all of us put together and I can never hear myself. You know, what we would like is some way to get a guitar that is not face up, but is face out. Same kind of thing. What can you do for us? Well, 
Leo, being a, a quite the tinkerer, came up with an idea um, to make a very simple guitar that could be reproduced easily. So unlike the Paul Bigsby guitar, he made it out of a simple slab of wood with no ornamentation, with very little uh, decoration in terms of its, uh, the cuts and the angles and the curves. And basically he slapped this all together in a plank, and we call it a plank, that could be played face out. And he called it the broadcaster because he was in the TV and radio business, but that name was already taken by a drum company. Uh, so he called it the Esquire, which didn't have quite enough of a space age name. This was 1949. So you had television, you had Telstar, you had telecommunications. He called it the Telecaster, a combination of broadcaster and television telecommunications. And being located in Southern California, this thing became an immediate hit, primarily because for the first time, guitar players could play and plug in and be heard. Now, when it comes to the origin and the, uh, the uh, what do you want to call it? the ownership of the electric guitar, we have some conflicting notions. Uh, on the left, you have the uh, Merle Travis guitar that was designed by Paul Bigsby, who was not a luthier, but designed several of these for Merle. On the right hand side, you have less, I'm sorry, Leo Fender and his Telecaster. And they do look pretty darn similar. Um, Leo claims or claimed when he was alive that, that Merle wanted more guitars and, 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 and uh, Paul wasn't gonna make them. So he just told Leo he should go make them. Leo said on occasions that he never actually saw the Bigsby guitar. You can think what you want, but Leo had the, the peace of mind and the brilliance or the state of mind and the brilliance to say, I can make this guitar very simply. It's all bolted together. It doesn't use glue like old acoustic guitars use. Everything's screwed together. And I can make a couple dozen of these a week and I can sell them to all these people who are coming into my store looking for electric guitars. So, we wonder, you might be wondering, where does Les Paul fit into all this? Um, Les Paul um, was in, I, I can't see any of you, but I'm gonna hope that most of you are my age or older, or many of you are. Les Paul was an extraordinarily popular guitarist in the late 50s, early 60s. He had a TV show and a radio show with his wife, Mary Ford, they were a duo. And, uh, he played in, in a huge number of the Bing bands. He was also Bing Crosby's go-to guitar player for his music sessions. Les was also like Leo Fender. He was a he was more he was a tinkerer, but he was more than a tinkerer, more so than uh, than Bigsby or Fender. He actually invented things. And and the thing that, that Les Paul invented that we can all appreciate here is the idea of of sound on sound recording. Now, prior to the invention of sound on sound recording, if you wanted to record a band or an orchestra, you took some microphones, put it into a room and everybody started at the same time. Um, and if anybody made a mistake while you were recording, you stopped and you had to start over again. So you might be the violinist, but the saxophonist keeps screwing up. Everybody's got to stop. You got to start over until you get it perfect. That was the downside of one track recording. Let us figure out a way to sort of divvy up the spaces on a piece of tape, recording tape, so that you could record one piece at a time, side by side. Think of a, like a four lane highway and each part of the, the tape being a lane. So that in the first lane, you could record the drums. And once the drummer was done, send him on his way. Uh, the next one could be the bass player. Once she's done, send her on her way then the vocalist and the keyboard player, on and on and on. You could record each piece of the orchestra or the band separately so that it didn't have to be an all or nothing proposition. And that's the way all recording has been done ever since. So we have Les Paul to thank for that. Now, Les in his career had a model called the Les Paul guitar. Still today, probably the best known model of guitar. 
simply because everybody knows the name Les Paul Guitar. Well, Les had come up with an idea in the 1940s. Um, it was essentially um, an idea to amplify or to pick up the vibrations from strings like George Beecham had done a decade before. But what he did is he took a four by four, a, literally a, a railroad tie, cut it to about the size of a guitar, put a neck on it, put some magnets on it, and figured out a way to amplify it. And this was in around 1942, between 1942 and 1944, um, before, uh, before Leo Fender had made his first guitar, which was 1949. But Les's idea was almost as unwieldy to play face out as a lap steel would have been. And he called it a log because essentially a four by four is a piece of wood that looks like a log. And he went to Gibson, which was at the time the largest guitar company in America, and said, look, I've got this guitar that can be amplified, but you play it face out, not face up like lap steels for Hawaiian bands. And the people at Gibson looked at it and said, you know, I'm not quite sure this electric guitar thing is more than anything more than a fad. Probably not going to catch on. So we're not really interested. And by the way, that's the ugliest guitar we've ever seen. So there's no way we would even think about selling. Well, Les left them with his kind of, with his tail tucked between his, his uh, tail tucked between his legs. And then uh, said, well, you know, I'll show them. And he took an acoustic guitar and cut it in half and put it on either side of the log so that at least now it was presentable. Yet it was still really heavy because it was a piece of log and Gibson wasn't convinced and the players who were around Les weren't convinced and Les kind of put that all to the side. However, in 1951, two years after the Telecaster came out, Gibson had a little light bulb go over its corporate head and say, you know what, okay, maybe the, uh, the electric guitar is not a fad and we should consider doing something. And they created their own guitar, which if you look at it here on the left, looks very similar in shape to uh, Mr. Bigsby and Mr. Fender's guitars. And they realized they were a little late to the party. So they said, we need somebody to endorse it. You know, who can we get to endorse our new electric guitar? And somebody in the executive suite said, well, Les was in here almost a decade ago. Maybe he'll come in and put his name on it. So they brought Les back and Les looked at it and said, yeah, it works fine. It's a great idea. You guys have done a great job, um, but I won't put my name on it unless you paint him gold. I want them painted gold so they don't look cheap like the fenders. The fenders to my mind look cheap. I want this to look like a, a luxury item product. And they did. So Les allowed his name to be put on it. And at that point, the Les Paul guitar was, was introduced to America in 1951. Now, as I showed you before with the Bigsby guitar and the uh, Telecaster, here's the Telecaster and the Les Paul. You can see the, the beautiful gold finish with highly polished chrome on the left on the Les Paul. And you can see the pretty utilitarian basic piece of wood slab on the right, which is Leo Fender's offering as a Telecaster. And I think um, we can jump over. We have an early Les Paul in the exhibit that Abby can show you. Um, there we go. Um, which is from, I believe that one's from 1958. Um, by that time they hadn't, they weren't painting them all gold, but they still had a really brilliant finish. And interestingly enough in this picture, if you look all the way to the left, you can see the Fender Telecaster in another display wall on the far left. But you know, the story of, of Les Paul inventing the electric guitar was a popular one that, that Les routinely told himself and was happy to kind of continue on with the, uh, the legend and maybe a bit of myth. So it's only been, I would say in the last 15, 20 years, actually since his death, that people have come around and saying, okay, we understand Les didn't invent it. There were other inventors before that, but he did have a significant contribution. So um, before we get to that, I can't see you all, but before I get to the, 
you know, the guitar that I think kind of defines the electric in, in this day and age. I'm going to look at something from the perspective of a non-musician. And that's this silhouette. And this silhouette, which again, I can't see you all, but I'm going to guess every single person watching this knows what this is a silhouette of. Um, it's a, apparently, according to many sociologists, the most recognizable silhouette of a man-made product in the world. You go anywhere in the world to any um, remote part of any continent and the people there will recognize this as a Coke bottle, the shape of a Coke bottle. It's just simply ingrained in all aspects of world culture. Allegedly, the second most easily recognizable image in silhouette of a man-made product is this guitar. Everyone allegedly around the world can look at this and say, yes, that's a guitar, an electric guitar. They don't know what the model is. They don't know what the name is, but they can say that's an electric guitar. So as far as man-made products, that was a pretty impressive achievement on the part of, of, uh, of the Fender company, which produced this guitar, which was called the Fender Stratocaster. Now the Fender Stratocaster followed the uh, Fender Telecaster by about six years. And the Stratocaster was different from all other guitars because of, first of all, its shape. It was designed to be contoured to fit into the curves of a person's body, to fit nice and flat against their abdomen. There's actually a cut in the back that kind of presses gently against your, your abdomen. A curve for you to put your elbow on. Um, these two horns are called cutaways. That allows you to get your hand farther up the fret to access more notes. It also had three pickups. You can see there the white horizontal lines with, with each one having uh, uh, six dots in it. Those pickups, it was the first time more than one or two pickups had ever been put in a guitar. And that extended the range of tones that a guitarist could play. So all of a sudden you had this great looking, very almost space age looking instrument that had a wide variety of tones was much lighter to play and much easier on your body. It wasn't as heavy. It didn't kind of cut into your abdomen. It became extremely popular, so popular that today, here we are in 2021, a full half century plus later, this is still the most popular shape and the most popular guitar in the world. Now, cool little story that goes along with that is, um, for those of you of a certain age, you all watched Looney Tunes. And Looney Tunes had this great um, intro that started with Well, that music was played by a gentleman named Freddie Tavares. And Freddie Tavares was a studio musician, guitarist. And when he retired, he went to work for Leo Fender as a draftsman, drawing pictures and, and schematics and diagrams. And Leo said, you've got to come up with something that doesn't look like the Telecaster. You've got to come up with like a guitar that doesn't look like anything else that's ever been done before. So Freddie Tavares came up with this shape on his own. And not many people know that. Most people know him because he played the Looney Tunes theme song, but he should be known for creating one of the most recognizable shapes of any product in the history of the world. Now, we're gonna look, I'm showing it to you here in red. Abby, can we go look at the, uh, the uh, one in the, the gallery quickly? Okay, this is an older one. It's kind of, you can't really tell, it's a beat up, it's almost a lime greenish color. Um, but I want you to, to just notice that its, uh, it's shape is, is so completely different from anything else that you'll see or have seen in the gallery. Um, and this kind of just highlights it a little more with it under the lights. Now, if we can go back to the, the picture that I just had there of the Telecaster on the presentation. Um, the, every guitar you've seen prior to this was basically a, a color that we call wood grain or off wood grain. Even the gold of, of Les Paul's, um, guitar was that gold didn't stray too far from a, a beautiful wood finish. And that's been true from the start of, of guitar making and luthier making hundreds of years ago on up to the 1900s. 
wood or treated wood or sunburst wood, something that showed the grain of wood was always important. But Leo realized that being in Southern California, which was home in the 50s to the beginning of car culture, that he had all these kids who were driving Thunderbirds and uh, Woodies and Corvettes that all had really cool colors that maybe, just maybe, if he painted his guitar as some of those colors, he would appeal more to the burgeoning youth culture in the 50s and early 60s. So what Leo did in a stroke of genius was he bought surplus paint from the car manufacturers, primarily DuPont paint, but he tied in the color offerings, first person to ever actually offer paint, uh, paint colors to, to customers. You could pick a color that was on your favorite color car. So you had Fiesta Red that was popular on Firebirds. You had Candy Apple Red that was popular on the early Mustangs. You had Lake Placid Blue or and Graffiti Yellow that were used on, uh, on the Bel Air. And all of these helped contribute to the spread, amazing spread of the electric guitar in the early 60s. As car culture grew, you had the Beach Boys, you had leading into the Beatles, leading into the Stones. You had these colorful guitars that no longer looked like your father's guitar. Even if your father's guitar was a Telecaster from 15 years before, or an acoustic guitar from 30 years before, these looked nothing like anything that had come before. And it really helped define the electric guitar as something that baby boomers, especially those playing in the early 60s, could embrace as something that was theirs and theirs alone. Now, by the end of the 1950s into the early 1960s, we have the Telecaster on the left, the Les Paul in the middle, and the uh, Stratocaster on the right. These were the definitive look of musical instruments, and they remain so to this day. If you go into any music store, you will see these exact instruments looking exactly like they did in the 1950s. And it's amazing because there are so many different kinds of guitars out there. And we've seen lots and lots and lots of variations on a theme. And there have been hundreds of manufacturers over the course of the, primarily the 70s and the 80s who've come and gone, who did all kinds of different shapes and all kinds of different colors. But we've really, as a culture, we keep going back to the, uh, the three standard shapes. These are still the three best-selling shapes in the world of guitars. And it's almost as if they came out of the factory or, or out of Leo's head or out of Gibson's uh, back room, perfectly formed and never needing to, to really be updated. And to kind of prove how true that is, let's look at, we're gonna finish up here. Let's look at how some things have evolved from the 1950s. Basic telephone that I hope a lot of you remember. Um, dialing, and if you missed the wrong dial or the wrong number when you dialed, you had to start all over again and wait for it to dial back. That was a big clunky piece of Bell technology. Today, an iPhone, this is an actual size comparison, has as much computing power as, as NASA had in the 60s and 70s. And it does almost everything you want it to do. They are two literally almost unrecognizable um, iterations of the exact same product. Now we go to the next thing, computers. In the 1950s and 60s, computers like ENIAC and, and UNIVAC filled entire rooms, literally entire rooms. Today, you've got a laptop that you can throw into your backpack. And in, in equivalent terms, the laptop has as much computing power as an entire state's worth of rooms filled with those big computers back then. So there's another change. Let's look at cars. You know, the top one is a Cadillac, those big, huge fins, two and a half tons of metal, big, huge grill with big headlights on the front, lots of real estate covered by bright, bright paint. Here we are all these decades later and you have this really sleek Cadillac where you're hiding the headlights, there are no fins, there's no extraneous decoration. It's smooth and it's slick. Again, not even, not even recognizable as the same product. Yet, here we go all these years later, you look at a Stratocaster from 
the day it was made, first made in 1954 to today, they are the exact same instruments, same dimensions, same specifications, except for some of the electronics has certainly been upgraded with you know, more modern potentiometers and, and better wiring, but it's the exact same instrument. Um, and it, it's a testament to the design elements of, of the guitar back in the, the 50s that they got it right the first time and that doesn't oftentimes happen. So in the years since, we've had tens of thousands of people, millions literally pick up the guitar. Uh, the guitar is the most popular instrument in the world, led by the electric guitar. There are more than 3 million guitars sold in the United States every year, 3 million. That's more than all other instruments combined. So if you take drums and saxophones and trumpets and keyboards and tram flutes and violins, all of those combined don't even add up to 3 million instruments a year. So the electric guitar has really found its way into the hearts and minds, not only of American culture, but world culture. And that sort of brings you right up to, uh, to our modern day, which takes me to the end of my presentation. And we have about 10 minutes or so if anybody wants to ask questions. Oh, I'm gonna show you this before I do answer any questions. Um, this is a guitar, one of the newest guitars in our collection. It looks kind of like a basic guitar with a little bit, the body's a little bit stranger. And the reason for that is the body was printed on a 3D printer. Um, that design came out of a printer using plastic printing and works every bit as well as a guitar made out of wood. Um, you know, people can argue what the resonant qualities of it are, but to think that here we are all these years later and guitarists and luth people who make guitars, luthiers, are still looking for new ways to create new bodies and new shapes um, shows kind of the unlimited potential of what the guitar still can be in decades to come. So, you know, the, the idea that the guitar is, is past its prime or is seen in its heyday uh, is certainly not necessarily true, especially because Fender Guitar just had its best year ever during the pandemic. They sold more guitars in 2020 than in any year in their 50 or 70 year history. So there's a, there's a presentation on the history of the electric guitar. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much. Um, I had the pleasure of walking through the exhibit with Mr. Newquist uh, when he was here uh, in helping install it, but I definitely learned a lot more tonight as well. Um, I think we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, and I did have one come in the chat, um, but please continue to send those. Um, David would like to, um, if you could, tell us a little bit more about the Ovation uh, Balladeer uh, that's in the exhibit. Oh, okay. The Ovation Balladeer is an acoustic guitar, actually. And um, for those of you that get to visit it, it's a, a guitar with a round back, much like an old oud or a lute, uh, not a flat back like most guitars have. And the Balladeer was created by a company called Ovation. And Ovation was started by a company, uh, the company Ovation was started by a man um, named Command. Um, and he was essentially a, a, a designer in the aircraft industry. He, um, he, Charlie Command, built rotor blades for helicopters during the Vietnam War. And he worked specifically on creating rotor blades that would reduce the sound of helicopters as they were flying into battle, to try and make them quieter. Well, Charlie made a lot of advancements or a lot of improvements to those designs, so much so that he left the military and went into creating, um, to starting his own company command, Charlie Command's company, to build those rotors on his own and then sell them back to helicopter manufacturers. So he became incredibly wealthy making these helicopter rotor blades out of carbon fiber. And he realized they had really impressive resident quality in terms of how they uh, controlled sound waves. His main passion in life was playing the guitar. So he put together a team of his aircraft aeronautical engineers, said, I want to make a guitar that's better at producing sound than a wood guitar, because I think our carbon fiber can really uh, change the way the guitar sounds. 
And so he, along with his, his engineers, created this guitar that had a round back. Um, and it did okay. It wasn't extremely popular. It was a little unwieldy. Um, but he did get one endorser. And that endorser, for those of you who remember, was going to get, oh, somebody in a picture over there has got one in front of him. Um, the, um, the, uh, now I'm completely distracted seeing, ah, there we go, one on the screen. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Wow, it's like having my own assistant. Um, actually, since you've got to turn it sideways again, so you can see how it's round in the back. And that roundness is, is carbon fiber. Um, and it's a little hard to hold on to because it is round. It tends to slip away from your body. But Glenn Campbell, who had the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour, agreed to be an endorsee. And I don't know if any of you remember, but on a Saturday nights, Glenn had a show where he would come out and uh, you know, say, hey, Saturday night, good night, I'm Glenn, or good evening, I'm Glenn Campbell. And they would do skits and he would have famous people like Johnny Cash or Chet Atkins or uh, Dolly Parton come on and, and sing a few songs and do a few humorous skits. Well, one of the things that drove him insane was because it was an acoustic guitar, he had to stand in front of a microphone in order for it to be um, amplified. You can't amplify an acoustic guitar with those kind of pickups I showed you earlier because the pickups themselves will start vibrating in all that open space and they'll create feedback. So if you think of all of those high school assemblies where you had somebody pick up the microphone and you had that screech, that always happened when you tried to amplify an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar with um, a pickup. So you had to stand in front of a microphone and he hated introducing somebody like Johnny Cash and saying, okay, here's Johnny Cash and we're gonna play a song. He had to take his guitar and take his, his microphone stand, walk over to Johnny Cash, put it down, set it up, and then they could play. He went back to command and said, this really sucks. I don't like this. There's gotta be a way for you to, to somehow amplify my acoustic guitar. Um, you've got this great technology on the back and you put something inside it. Well, Charlie and his team figured out that they, could, they created a kind of pickup which gets into lots of technology stuff. It's called a piezo pickup. And instead of picking up the vibrations from the strings, it picked up, picked up all that heavy vibration from the front of the guitar. So instead of sliding it under here so it could hear the strings, it was actually down here so it could pick up the vibrations of the guitar and then transmit those vibrations from the top of the guitar to the amplifier. So the first night that Glenn Campbell was able to walk on stage with that guitar plugged in and said, tonight my guest is Chet Atkins. And he walked across the stage without moving a microphone, changed the acoustic guitar forever. And within three months, the Ovation Balladeer became the most popular guitar in America because you had people ranging from Peter, Paul and Mary, Cat Stevens, Crosby, Stills, Nash, John Denver, all these people who now realize they could play concerts without being tethered to a regular stand-up microphone that had to amplify their guitar. So for nearly a decade, the Ovation Balladeer, for all its weirdness as, as a round-backed instrument, was one of the most popular guitars ever, simply because you now had an amplified acoustic guitar. Eventually, companies like Yamaha and Martin and Gibson all figured out how to do the same thing, and Ovation's fortunes eventually waned, and today, there's not much of an ovation left. They're actually a division of a, a drum company. But for a while, that guitar led the way into turning acoustic guitars into amplified guitars. And that's the story. Um, thank you. John would like to know um, if you could give us your opinion on the preservation of vintage instruments versus being able to use it as an active instrument that can have modifications or upgrades? Wow, good question. Um, there's, there's one major problem with guitars. And the fact is that the, they're made of wood and wood deteriorates. And especially for acoustic guitars, that means they're not gonna last very long unless they're cared for very, very well and stored very well. And as a guitarist, and any of you who are guitarists, we may all treat our guitars with love, but they're still gonna get banged up. 
And there are times you lean them against a chair and they fall, or you hang them up again on the wall and leave them for a while. Guitars tend to take a beating, so they don't last very long. Now, having said that, there is a huge market for vintage guitars, especially those of limited production. The Les Paul that I showed you earlier um, is the most prized guitar, especially from the years 1959, 1958 through 1960, when only a few hundred were made. And some of those now have gone for as much as three quarters of a million dollars, when originally they were sold for about $250. Um, that's because they're so rare. And I think, I think there's an importance when you have that number, if you have a few hundred, you have, a, you have enough that musicians can play them and take them on the road. You have people like Joe Bonamassa or um, Jimmy Page who can play those and take them out and still continue to make great music with them, especially live. But I also think it's important to preserve them so that as that dwindling level of, of guitars, or as guitars dwindle, either they get older, they break, and they've got to be modified. Um, you know, I think places like museums need to have them. As far as modifying them, that's a really interesting philosophical question. One that I have with art directors a lot of time, which is, you know, if somebody buys the Mona Lisa, it's theirs. Are they able to do anything they want with it? If they want to cut it up with a razor blade, can they? Well, if they owned it, yes, technically they could. Should they? The art world would say no. Ethically, we would say as, appreciate, as appreciators, as people who appreciate art, we would find that to be a travesty. So the same might be said of vintage guitars, especially those from, from the 1950s and 60s, um, where there are fewer and fewer, that if you modify them, you're kind of modifying a part of history, and it's probably better to just build a new one to the exact same specifications and modify and tweak that one to your heart's content. So um, I think we'll, uh, I'm going to uh, be selfish and wrap up with one final question from me, um, which is, uh, you know, this exhibit has been a really fantastic uh, exhibit for us to host right now, especially as people are able to start getting out a little bit more after um, a pretty, um, you know, difficult year for a lot of folks. And so with just a few weeks left, if there's people watching who haven't seen the exhibit or if there's people watching who have and are considering another visit, um, what would be kind of your statement on why this exhibit is uh, so important to come see um, and kind of what you hope people get from the exhibit? Well, I think that because the guitar is the world's most popular instrument, it's affected everybody somehow. Maybe you play or someone in your family played or you used to play or you want to play or you listen to music that you love that's played on the guitar or your favorite artist plays a guitar. And I think that anybody who comes into the exhibit will find not only something they personally can relate to in terms of the guitar and the music that the guitar has made, but also find a lot of things that they never realized about the history and the evolution of the guitar and what's made it such an important part of our culture and why it has become so popular. And so I think that not only will you see things that you love and, and can relate to, but there's so much there that, uh, that you might uncover that you never dreamed even existed. I'll uh, jump back on camera here to say goodbye to everybody. Um, thank you so much to Mr. Newquist for joining us. Um, again, the exhibit is here until April 25th. Um, my personal favorite, which I did not have a chance to uh, make uh, you answer a question about, is the authentic air guitar that's in the exhibit. Um, I've had a lot of fun telling people about that. So I Very hope you cool. can all come uh, check it out. You can get advanced tickets on our website. I want to thank our sponsors of the exhibit one more time. A huge thank you to Mr. Newquist for joining us this evening and to uh, you all for signing on as well. Have a great night. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time.